Good evening and welcome to Night Colors Bigfoot Radio. You're here with your hostess, Lauren Smith, and I am very happy to be back. I've been on hiatus. I did a little live video earlier on Facebook and Instagram explaining a little bit why I've been gone. Um, it's been a rough year personally, um, but I am back and I am happy to have you here tonight and our guest, Andy McGrath from Britain. Um, he is one of the crowd favorites. He's been on here before, but he's done a lot since he was last on, so I can't wait to get started interviewing him tonight. Uh, before we get started, I just want to ask that you show that Nightcallers team some love by sharing, liking, commenting, all the things that show us some love tonight. And don't forget to check out my website for more stuff, nightcallersproductions.com. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and bring Andy on, and I hope that you'll join in the live chat with your questions. Be sure to type them in all caps for my moderators. And if you're listening through the podcast, go ahead and hit that like button. All right. Hi, Andy. How are you doing tonight? I'm good. How are you? I don't know if it's nighttime where you are right now, actually. It's, it's definitely <laughs> nighttime. It's it's tomorrow, in fact. It's 12, oh 35 in the morning. You agreed to this? Oh, my goodness. Of course. Of course. Night owl. This, I'm, I'm just oh. getting started. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I, I would. Oh, I just don't know if I'd be functional right now. Um, I am very happy to have you back on the show. Um, I was telling him before the show, last time I had him on, he was a field researcher and an author. Now, Mr. McGrath is a speaker, presenter, podcaster, field researcher, and author. <laughs> So you are so busy. I asked him if he was going to add prime minister in there and he said not this year. So, you know. No, no. We I mean we've already had enough switch arounds in that department, I think, for the UK. Uh we got a new prime minister again. So, um let's see how she does. Maybe I'm, um, you know, if she's if they're up for somebody useless in government, I I might throw my my name into the hat. I mean, I feel like if you can manage the Bigfoot community, then I think you've you've got this in the bag. You can manage oh yeah. A whole country. It's fine. Oh, oh di <laughs> diplomacy involved. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, look, it's um all those things you mentioned, by the way. I mean, they all sort of, you know, they're branches of the, you know, stretching out from the same tree essentially. It's it's our way of saying, I'm willing to do other things. Please hire me. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I, I loved that you put it that way because it's true. Um, I've, I've branched out into so many different things just from the Bigfoot world alone, but it all stems back to that research and finding that all the things we can do to help further the information going out to get this mystery solved, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, how can we get more people involved? How can we spread our name around and, and, be invited to those, you know, those other research parties, so to speak. And yes. that's that's one of my main things these days, especially making friends, saying yes to everything, and just mm -hmm. turning up and, and trying to be, you know, um, uh, an involved guy. Well, you're very involved. <laughs> so you do um, you do your own podcast now. So I'm, I'm very excited to hear about that later. Um, in addition to speaking, presenting, podcasting, researching, um, I believe you're in a, you've been in a few documentaries and then you, you've written your books. I mean, you've, you've just, you've grown so much. And we were discussing before the show how your growth um, has contributed to the growth of that, the topic where you're from. So before this wasn't really... I, I myself, I had never really heard of um, the Bigfoot phenomenon or even cryptids all that much in the British area. But now, mm -hmm. due to your contribution, like it's really growing. Uh, that's really kind. Of, I, I mean, it would be nice to think that um, the visibility, it hasn't been huge, but some visibility they've had well, would perhaps encourage other people to, to get involved and say, okay, maybe this is something there's room for other people to, to enter into as well, which there cert it certainly is, you know, there's, there's plenty of room here. And mm -hmm. uh, I've met some really great new researchers as well as the fact of, you know, there were many people here before me doing it and very mm -hmm. successfully. And, you know, there's tons of names I could just pull out of the hat that I've, I've <laughs> essentially learned so much of what I knew from. And that's, that's the thing about this community is that the good researchers out there are, are essentially you know, they're giving they're, they're opening themselves up and you can often ask them questions so i've often been on the internet asking questions in the uk of people like carl shuker or richard freeman or 
or John Downs from the, the CFC and uh, Paul Sinclair, Chris Turner, all those guys mm-hmm. who are completely willing and very happy to just get involved, as well as, you know, the Loch Ness guys, Steve Felter, Adrian Shine, who just say, yeah, yeah, what do you need to know? You know, I'm, I'm happy amazing. to talk to you. It's great. Mm-hmm. And I think it's important to be that way because you were mentioning in your earlier clip the next generation mm-hmm. of researchers. Now, yes. as much as I'd like to be like a new generation, I, I am 46, so I'm not exactly <laughs> new. Um, but it's nice to think that there's other people, and I'm meeting younger people, younger than myself, all the time, mm-hmm. who are just starting and saying, Yeah, yes. you know, I'm interested in this. And, um, where do I go to look? Can you suggest any good areas or have you tried this method or that method? To, yes. To track? We have to be open to teaching. Um, we have to not only be open to teaching, but we have to be teachable ourselves. Um, we yeah. have to be able to learn new things and try new things because none of us has the corner market on Bigfoot. None of us can say, well, this is what works. This is it. Because if that was the case, then you would have solved the mystery. It would have worked. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so um, definitely the next generation is... Uh, something that we all need to be good stewards of their education. Um, this past weekend, I went to Alabama on a camp out and I met uh, three, two young men that were, oh my goodness, if they were 20, I'll eat my hat. They were so young. Um, one was going into um, the Air Force. The other was a naval, no, a, a naval base. He was on a naval base somewhere. Like, I mean, these two yeah. young guys and they were out there staying in hammocks learning everything that they could about this topic. And to me that they weren't out at a frat party drinking. They weren't, you know, playing video games. They're out in the woods learning about this creature. And that just, to me, that was amazing. So I was really excited about that. It kind of lent a little bit of uh, support to my presentation that I did over the next generation. But you do have to be open to teaching that next generation. And so the people there that you've spoken to that have opened up to you, that's amazing because there are so many that will not share um, their information, their research. I mean, you don't have to share your research area so that you protect the integrity of the yeah, research area, yeah. but sure. sharing different things uh, to help others further their own research. That's, that's how we're going to win. That this definitely game. makes sense. I mean, if you've got a very specific area that's sensitive that, you know, you don't want people try traipsing through there the whole time right. and, and disrupting the whole thing. But doesn't mean you you can't share and especially you know uh anecdotal reports and stories so many things have been shared with me that i simply could not have interviewed that amount of witnesses personally or by myself it's impossible and you know you use so much source material when you're when you're writing a book anyway because Mm -hmm. of that i mean with my recent one it's an international book so i couldn't have interviewed the four or five hundred different people right <laughs> in there but you know fortunately I had some good people pass some good research to me and, and some people i spoke to and others i had those those great books that have gone before from those great researchers to use in places as source material but right and, and that's very important and i think um it's just about being approachable you know and mm-hmm. i i've actually learned so much and um Again, slipping to this dad head thing. My wife keeps telling me, you're sounding older than you are. But <laughs> I've recently been working with very young people who are adults. Mm-hmm. And that really messes me up. That somebody <laughs> is an adult, but they're 26 years younger than me or something yes. like that. Yes. I, I don't like that. I like it, but I, I don't like what it reminds me of. Right. And um, yeah, that you are heading, plummeting headlong towards 50, essentially. <laughs> and yeah. Um, which is terrifying, clearly. I know. But it, what else could it be? It's that when you finally, because I find myself doing this, like over the weekend, I was talking to those two young, younger guys, and um, I find myself actually being able to use the wisdom card, you know, like all the, okay. all the crappy things that I went through in my 20s and mm. early 30s, and I'm finally able to say, well, let me tell you something, and then kind of help them out a little bit, you know. And so, yeah, that's if that's the trade off, I'll take it. <laughs> that's fair enough. I always tell people that when I was twenty one, I believed that I was a man, you know, like a grown man sort of thing, yes, and or yeah. whatever a man meant then. I I believed that I'm I'm twenty one. I'm a man. And I mm-hmm. felt it like fully felt it. And since then, I've realized that I was just a complete ruse. <laughs> you never <laughs> yes. actually ever feel grown up. Yes. Uh, my grandfather oh, yeah. used to say to me, um, you know, uh, 
And there's always somebody older than you sunning you out. So when you're 70, the guy who's 80 thinks you don't know anything yet. Yeah. You know, and when you're 80, it's a 90 year old. And the only time you actually really ever have to worry is when there's nobody older than you anymore. And I never yeah. thought about it that way. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. the, I've never thought about it that way. But I mean, that kind of lends to what I said earlier about you always need to be teachable because there's always something to learn. Um, if you're Absolutely. not learning, then you've got one foot in the grave, you know. Absolutely. Hey, you know, you think the 70s is bad. Wait till you reach us guys in the 80s kind of thing and yeah, so on and so forth. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yes, that's definitely uh, that's something to think about is, you know, um, and I've noticed, uh, you know, we'll get back to Bigfoot in a second. But I've noticed that the older I get, my scary age used to have that scary age where you're like, oh, my mm. gosh, when I'm that age, I will be old. My scary age keeps going up. Like, yeah, of course. I'm five years away from what used to be my scary age. And now I'm like, oh, that's going to be amazing. You know, I'll have, I'll be settled and I'll have, you know, a retirement fund and like, I'll be excited about all these boring things. <laughs> so it's just funny how that changes. Um, okay. Yeah. So you have been doing this for over 25 years. Yeah. Like almost 30 now, actually. Um, oh my goodness. It was 25 when I started in 2016. You need to up. You need to update your bio. I need to update it, but it just sounds <laughs> even that. I it almost is an, too much of an indicator of, of age because twenty five is like okay, that's a long time, but thirty is like hey. How long oh my I started when I was a teenager. It's just for everybody who's is listening. I was a teenager. <laughs> I didn't start when I was like thirty, and that's thirty years ago. But um, you know, I mean, that's... you should probably list that. Just say um, almost yeah. thirty years of uh, being involved in this topic, starting as a teen. That's what I put on mine <laughs> because teen, mine, exactly. I have twenty years of experience in this topic because I yeah. started as a preteen with my mother. So okay. I'm able to say I'm not just I don't have really good Botox. I'm just I started when I was really young. Yeah, so. like we're rocking the Botox <laughs> here, both of us. We're surgery now. <laughs> yeah. We got all the we're work done. There. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So you started this over twenty five years ago. Mm -hmm. And I know that we've touched on this in past shows, but really quick, just for in case somebody doesn't want to dig up the past show, what got you started on this topic? It was just those those programs that were around in the 70s, which I later watched, you know, in my I saw in my sort of early teens, um, like In Search of Arthur mm -hmm. C. Clarke's Mysterious World, all of that kind of stuff. And there was also a bunch of there were a bunch of magazines that were out at that time as well that seemed to have a sort of a paranormal side some mm -hmm. comic strip i don't know the names of them anymore i used to have them for a long time and there was always some sort of bigfoot sighting or nessie sighting that was coming along with that i would just i would collect them you know and, and just keep this thing of them and then the internet came in and i joined the chat rooms and the forums and youtube happened i was like wow you know this is extra yeah. thing and facebook and we can start talking together and i was just stringing along uh, and that was my research. I would go out on little hunts like the Loch Ness and different places like that. Uh, but I wasn't serious. You know, then in 2016, at age 40, um, I'd been working in central London for seven years at that point, had a family, married, 50 hour weeks, three hour daily commutes. Mm -hmm. And we'd saved a bit of money. And, um, you know, I decided let's just do our own projects for a while, you know. And she said, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. Maybe I'll go back to music. I'd play music for a long time or something else. And she said, what about this monsters thing that you're always <laughs> talking about? This, you know, your monsters. Why don't you write something or write a TV program or something or a book? And uh, I was like, yeah, yeah, I could do that, couldn't I? You know, I could write about them. And I immediately, almost immediately said, I'm going to write this book and started mm -hmm. blogging it right away like chapters of what would be in the book and then somebody right. um uh just to answer encrypted phil by the way i have looked into the wheels uh, around london i'll talk about that in a minute okay um <laughs> yes in the in the chat there yeah so mm -hmm. i just um yeah i just started blogging it and somebody interviewed me a guy called daniel benoit was really nice Oh, yes. And he said, would he you come nice. on my show? <laughs> it was my first ever interview. And I said, yeah, sure, I will. And I chatted to him. And after his show, like, lots of invites started coming in. So I spent the first year writing this book and blogging it and interviewing about it before it was even finished. Oh, my gosh. And then finished it. And there was a first version. And it was like a first version of somebody who'd never written a book before. <laughs> and then <laughs> I did a second one. And that was a bit better. And then 
in 2021, I uh, I just I signed up with um, uh, Untold uh, mm-hmm. a Hangar One Publishing, sorry, uh, yes. with Alex Hycheck, and I signed a production deal with White Wolf Entertainment to make a TV series of my new book series. That is so Which we're exciting. still pitching, by the way. It's, right. it's in the pitch. It's still going on. We just finished a new pitch today, actually. So we're hoping to get, to get that done. Uh, that is and very it's exciting. Beast of the World. Got it ready. Sorry. Yes. Plug. <laughs> it's okay. And um, it was a, supposed to be the beginning of a seven-part series. And in fact, it is. The second one is due out at Christmas or January. And each book looks internationally at a certain set or group of cryptids or types of cryptids. Mm-hmm. And I guess I got about four or five years of writing to get them all done. Um, but yeah, that's the first one. And we're, we're sort of on our route now. It's kind of up and running. Hopefully the series will happen. It's not that's, told. That's very exciting. Did you think mm-hmm. that when you started this way back when that this would ever be a thing? Or were you just you just content to write your book or maybe finish it out as a blog? I mean, did you ever think that you would be signed with a publisher and um, talking about putting it into production for a series and speaking at events and starting a podcast. I mean, you've, you've come so far. It's amazing. I didn't, didn't think any of it actually. And I literally, my wife had sort of framed it in a way of, look, you've got no friends. You've been working and being a father in London all this time. You don't go out because we don't have any time in London terms. When you see a friend in London, it's like, what are you doing now? I'd say, what are you doing in the beginning of December? Mm-hmm. And they would say, oh, wait, let me look. Do, 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 do. Oh, I could fit you in at two o'clock on the 15th or something like that. Mm-hmm. And that's your best friend in London terms. And um, so it was very boring. She said, maybe you'll get to meet some like-minded people and talk to them. And that was literally mm-hmm. it. Do a, a, like a little project, take some time off this constant work we've been doing nonstop. For years and years and years and this corporate i was in healthcare and, and she was in uh she's in psychology and i just thought well, let's just get out and do something and yeah it just kind of got a little out of hand <laughs> so. a, a little um i think it's more just you're you're very versatile you're you're di- well, you're a diverse funny. person we'll put it that way um Okay, so tell me about your books. You have Beast of Britain was the first one, of course. Yes. <laughs> um, this the second one, the um, Hairy Humanoids. Yeah, so that's that's the first of the Beasts of the World series. Right. So it's Beasts of the World. Uh, volume one is Hairy Humanoids. Okay. Volume two, I'm currently writing is Water Monsters and oh, awesome. So on okay. and so forth. I won't tell you all of the other names of the books other than to say there's seven possibly eight. Oh my goodness that is yeah. so exciting <laughs> that, is, really that is amazing yeah and this that one this amazing. one's 375 pages and oh they're all about that about 350 uh, currently um water monsters the one i'm writing at the moment is at 547 so i'm trying to condense it down um and that's always normally the problem there's too much and right. i've got a sort of squish it down and but the format in these books is there's an intro to every creature Mm -hmm. a type of creature so for example with the hairy humanoids what i'm kind of trying to propose is that there could be and it's not the newest idea out there but it's one i've always been interested in there could be different types of hairy humanoids so there's not only bigfoot but there could be different types of species so you hear jeff meldrum and lauren coleman talk about these things sometimes or uh, hall talking about there's the man apes these you know these massively built hair covered upright hominids they're very big seven to nine mm-hmm. feet tall taller sometimes they have those large wide flat feet like a humans so that's what we commonly call bigfoot or sasquatch mm-hmm. right and they don't have an arch they have to have that weird midfoot flexibility like uh, the mid tarsal ridge mm-hmm. and then there's in europe especially in, in western asia and some parts of asia there's the wild men types which seem to be more caveman like or neanderthal like again they're they're hair covered they're well built but they're five to seven feet tall and then they seem to have distinct head hair oftentimes from their body and feet that are more like a human's but wider and uh, in many cases they actually closely match uh fossilized footprints of uh neanderthals and then you have others like the yeti would be like a relic or a relic ape according to some five and a half uh, to seven and a half feet tall, stocky, ape-like, 
bipedal and quadrupedal in many cases, shifting on to things like little foot, like nice. the orang pendic or uh, the Janjari of Australia, or what sometimes could have been archaically in the past, things like trolls or, or brownies mm -hmm. in Europe or, right. or Pacoites and other things in, in North America, like a proto pygmy or mm -hmm. a diminutive primate of some kind. So the book looks into that and goes through other things as well, like monkey monsters and mm -hmm. dogmen and amphibious types of uh, anthropoids and selects four or five different types. But each section of the book, it's laid out in the same way. You have an intro, then you have the etymology of the name, their measurements, their tracks, their behaviors, mm -hmm. their diet, uh, their habitats, and then sightings and evidence and theories about them. That's amazing. And it, you can just you can pop in anywhere at any point in the book and just pick out one of the creatures and say okay today right. I'm just going to read about that. I think that your book would be an amazing um, well first of all there's a lot in there that I think would be great information for people who have even been researching for as long as I have because it, again it's never too late to learn something new um, but I think also a good starter guide for people who maybe don't know as much about these creatures and that need to know how diverse this topic actually is. I mean, you kind of, it's all inclusive guide to Bigfoot or hairy beast of the world, you know, mm. hairy humanoids, volume <laughs> one beast of the world. <laughs> um, but no, I, I really think that, that sounds blog. amazing. I do. I do. Um, so absolutely. And um, I have where everybody, if you will go to the description of this show, whether you're on Facebook or YouTube or a podcast, the links to all of Andy's works will be in the description. So you guys can visit his link tree and that's going to take you to everything that he does. You can actually just go to his Amazon links for his books. Also, don't forget to follow him on Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, Pinterest, all of the all of good places that we like to shout out our our things that we do that we're a little bit proud about. Um, so I wanted to ask um, your books. My question just left my head because that's that's, that's okay. about where it is today. We've got so much in common. We really have. <laughs> you know, that happens oh to me regularly, all the time. And just oh, generally. I was, I was going to ask, um, do you have an audio book? Are, are you narrating your audio books yet? No, I'm not. So uh, both the books, Beast of Britain and Beast of the World, Volume 1, have audiobook versions available. Mm -hmm. So that's that's free on Audible. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have Audible, otherwise, I, I think you pay for it like a normal book, and you you get the file. Yes. Um, and that was in uh, narrated by uh, an English guy called okay, Jonathan okay. Rufus Welsh. Yes. Which is he's a really great narrator. Now, I did yes. think about narrating them. People often say I like your voice. I don't know why people say that, but sometimes they seem to like my voice and they want me to talk. It's a good That's voice. That's nice. <laughs> Thank you. But. Yes. I'm not a narrator. I'm not a professional narrator, even if my own stuff. And I, uh, the few attempts I've made at home kind of mm -hmm. showed me that you know, either you're going to have to take some kind of um, instructional course on how yes. to do this yes. to make it good. Otherwise, you know, you're not, um, you're not, you can't just hop in and do it on yes. the fly. It's actually, it, it's a skill. It's a, that you it's don't a currently skill. Have. <laughs> It's a profession. Um, so I yeah. got into narrating over the summer um, and learned all okay. about it. Voice acting is what it's actually called. And oh, wow. it is you act. You have to practice um, hours every day to get that skill, the inflection. Mm -hmm. um, I've listened to a lot of podcasts where authors try to narrate their own stories and they learn mm -hmm. that they can't do it. I've had um, if I have advice for authors um, if you are wanting your book to be narrated, a uh, voice narration, um, audio book, go back and read it out loud. And, um, because there are certain things that you cannot bring across in voice narration. Mm. Um, I've learned that actually, but I'm, I was just asking because I think that, um, I, for one, um, if it was read with an accent like yours, uh, that just, uh, brings even more to the book. So, I'm oh. very glad that you had a an Englishman do that. That was good. Okay. I was given um, the choice. Yeah, yes. American or English. <laughs> yeah. I said, well, for this one, I gave the guy a nice review as well because he was so good. good. And he good. actually contacted me all the way through about pronunciations and a and, uh, yes. few spelling errors. And yes. um, yeah, my review of him was I couldn't have said it better myself. And I think that's, <laughs> I think that's, that's perfect. true. And, oh, my yeah, gosh. He did a great job. 
That's amazing. Um, yes, I think, you know, just um, it, it's there, there's just, there's a skill to that, but it brings the story across. And I'm, I'm glad that you gave him a good review because it sounds like from the names of some of the creatures in the book, um, having had to pronounce things like that in the books that I've narrated, it's, it's difficult. You know, um, a friend of mine, Hadley Thorne, she's an author and she uh, hosts Weird Realities. And she has books that have um, different um, Norse terms in them and oh, wow, okay. Norse names. And I have mm -hmm. had to message her and ask her just to do like promos for her. I'm like, mm. I, I'm going to need you to write that in crayon because I have no idea what that means or how to say it. At, yeah, a Latin alphabet, but with a different pronunciation guide. So um, mm -hmm. I grew up in Wales, which is a little enclave on the, the, the side of England. Mm -hmm. But they have they have a different language there it's it's an old celtic language and it's it's latin alphabet but it's mm -hmm. completely different so if you had two d's together there's a th sound a u at the end yes. of a word is like an e sound and yes. you know all of these different things uh uh oh what is the v f when f is a v and you know all oh of these gosh. different things and if you know it you know it and um yes, if you yes. don't how could you possibly know how exactly. that should be said and yes, I think exactly. That's just normal. Absolutely. Good on you. I, I'd love to do narration, but I think, you know, a good three to six months of instruction that it would definitely be necessary to. Um, it it takes quite a bit of mm. um, of training and different tips and tricks. Mm. And there's a lot of great resources out there, but you have to have the time to dedicate to it, which I it doesn't sound like you do. So um, no. <laughs> you keep trying to um, educate the world about uh, the Beast of Britain and the Beast of yeah. the World, and we will narrate it. I'll leave it to the narrators. That? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right. I have a few questions from the chat that I'm going to okay. get out of here real quick, um, and then I will move on to the other questions that I have. Okay, um, Bigfoot Society, Jeremiah Byron hosts Bigfoot Society podcast. He's a good friend of mine. He says, is there a UK version of a cryptid related must visit place? Like here in America, we have Bluff Creek oh. in California. Mm -hmm. Besides Loch Ness, is okay. there somewhere that's like you just have to go there? Yeah, so there's a place here called Cannock Chase, C-A-N-N-O-C-K chase as okay. in i chase you kind of chase and that's in staffordshire um mm -hmm. there's the very famous story of the uh 70s 1970s story of uh, uh somebody being uh, witnessing three trolls when broken down in the car a couple one night uh and the three diminutive three to four foot tall hairy hook nosed trolls there's also stories of ufo sightings around there there's several um, large black dog and werewolf sightings from that place and and possibly very recently acclaimed Bigfoot print and some Bigfoot sightings as well. Uh, there, there is a caveat to that, like all of mm -hmm. these places that are very popular in that I always kind of saw those places, especially something like Can of Chase, it's almost like riding the London bus ghost tour, you know, when right. you get to London and visiting all the, the locations and you get on the the bus, the black bus with the ghost painted on it. Yes. They take you to all these haunted places and the likelihood that you're going to have some experience is very small because it's so popular. Right. Yes. On a positive side, Canuck Chase is very rural and very isolated. So it's not like you're, you're in a queue of people trying to experience something. Okay. Um, but I wondered if, if the reports emanating from there are always genuine or just mm -hmm. experienced by sensitive persons. Right. I don't know. Right. Yeah, not diminishing it. I haven't, yeah, right. I haven't been there to, to to prove one way or another. Absolutely no. Um, that sounds fascinating. That is, I mean, that's not even just paranormal. I mean, that's paranormal. That's cryptid. That's folklore. There's there's a lot going on in yeah. that spot. It's like it's kind of a classic high it? strangeness. Uh, yeah. Yes, that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say um, like a black hole for weirdness but i like the way you put that a lot better that was a lot more eloquent than what i said okay um that for weirdness that's awesome i yeah, take that <laughs> i should put that on a shirt yeah. um where all have you traveled for your research that is from pyromedic um not very far actually so i've been all all around the uk mm -hmm. in almost every part of the uk looking obviously the lakes are very uh i was a, a lake monster guy first and foremost always so loch ness okay. and 
um, Lake Bala and Lake Windermere and all the different sort of sea locales as well uh, around the UK being very interesting to me. I also looked at a few invasive species or um, unexpected species um, sightings. So I went hunting for Benny the Beluga Whale <laughs> when he was in uh, the Thames for six months, two years ago uh, from the Arctic. And um, I also went hunting for Wally the Walrus uh, in, in Cornwall and Wales when he visited bits and pieces like that so i i also i like out of place animals i like um invasive species as, as okay. a s study subject uh very recently and this doesn't sound very impressive to anybody here but we have an invasive population of chinese mitten crabs and i was recently walking through bushy park in the center of london and found one in the field being attacked by a crow oh my gosh uh, it's about this big and it's a crab like about 20 feet from a pond and literally it's fresh it's in fresh water it's a huge crab in the middle of a mm -hmm. london park and it's native now oh my goodness that kind of stuff it's not very interesting to people but it, it is to me <laughs> um I get it. apart from that i've been to the us i went uh researching Lake champlain okay. uh, in kentucky and a few other places and awesome. uh, around maine but, but that's about the size of it um what i'm hoping with the beast of the world uh, TV series, which you know, fingers crossed. If you've got yes. uh, any views on that, please uh, comment positively in the chat. <laughs> uh, we'll get to sell that. And if that happens, it will literally be a cryptid travel show. We will go to every far flung place in the world. Oh my Kamchatka, goodness! Kamchatka to Malaysia to every single place you can think of, but locations you've never seen before. And we'll, you know, we'll we'll sit there in the middle of the Congo wherever mm -hmm. being eaten alive by insects or, <laughs> or worse perhaps will yes. will be there so um yeah I'm hoping to, to really branch out that's amazing that would be mm -hmm. amazing um everywhere that you've gone so far is amazing but that would be amazing to be able to travel that far and to share that because you know that's going to spawn even more books <laughs> yeah yeah well and just to get there and meet those people i love people like living in london there's so many people from every part of the world parts of in fact i never heard of before even mm -hmm. before i got here and it's just great it's just great to meet people and find out about them and what they do and what they think and the, the kind yes. of things that sort of make up their mindset it's so interesting yes that i mean any everywhere you go has a different culture even from you know here to um, Texas, like right mm. next to my state, you know, everywhere has a different culture and it's amazing to find out about, you know, what they do. Um, Michael Miller said, is Sasquatch in the UK? If so, where and what do they call it? Um, in the UK, there is a British Bigfoot phenomena. Um, it was, or it's been linked to historically the Woodwows or the Green Man. <laughs> And uh, the woodwows in British history and also in European history are these hairy man-like creatures, bipedal creatures that appear on the um, noble heraldry of certain royal families and, and noble families, and also on tapestries and more importantly, in the sculptures, uh, wooden and stone sculptures of cathedrals from oh. the 11th and 12th century up to the 13th in some cases. So these are, you know, in, many cases sculptures that are almost a thousand years old or sometimes tapestries that are older than that that show hairy bipedal men walking mm -hmm. around the place there is a you know there's a slight problem with that where these could be representations of a forest spirit or a variation on the satyr perhaps in mm -hmm. or the god sylvanus the shepherding god or heracles um uh, the greek god because many of them do carry clubs in fact it's a very common um, depiction of a wood woes they see it carrying a big wooden club hmm. which the god Heracles was supposed to do but you're looking at the same time at a very hairy hair covered in fact, man of some kind um, there are modern day sightings there's a the very interesting one one of my favorite ones very close to here in, in a place called Box Hill in Surrey uh, where uh, there's a big hill uh, uh, branching out onto the countryside, the, the, the North Downs and the, the, the South Downs. And this hill has earthen steps cut into it that go 740 feet up into the hill. And a lot of crazy people, fitness fanatics, run it in the summer and run up and down and exercise that oh way. Oh my I goodness. I walk occasionally and taking lots <clears> of breaths. 
<laughs> and um, there was a runner there in 2012, a lady. It was evening, it was summer. She'd stopped uh, after her run, sat down for an energy drink, and she heard somebody coming behind her. And assuming it was a dog walker out late, kind of moved to the side. Nobody came by. She looked behind her to see what she described as a six foot plus tall, heavy set, hairy man with a square jaw and um, like man crossed between man and ape-like features uh, looking at her, a terrifyingly muscular creature just staring at her about 10 oh meters back. It watched her for maybe 30 seconds before turning around and heading off up the hill. Now, the path curves like this, so you, you don't really mm -hmm. have to walk very far before you're out of sight, and it's heavily wooded on each side as well. And after the creature left, she she smelled this uh, stale farm animal-like smell, which I thought was a very important aspect to this, that yes. Bigfoot smell. Right. Left after, uh, oh, oh, I suppose, left to, to stop her following it, whatever the, the defensive aspect of this, this um, ability might be. And that's one of my favorites. It's close to me. It's about five right. miles from here. It's in a, an area that has great green corridors branching out to the countryside, but it's also a really popular national park where people walk their dogs all the time. Oh, my Literally gosh. Literally all the time. Apparently, she'd heard wood knocks before, about half an hour before, but at that time, she didn't know what that was. She just thought she could hear yeah. banging in, in the forest. Mm -hmm. Um, that's a great one. There's another great one in Abernethy Forest. And there are many, by the way, but this is one of my favorites. That was made by a primate keeper of 37 years in 2012 also. I don't know what it is about that year, but it was <laughs> this year for sightings. He and his brother, they were uh, wild camping in that area in Abernethy Forest in Scotland, which is actually not that far from Loch Ness as, as the crow flies. A very rural, rural area. They go out hunting rabbits in the morning and they'd suddenly seen some big sort of hairy lump about 50 feet ahead uh, hunched over a blackberry bush in front of them. And uh, the creature seemed to hear them and, and cock its head to the side and stand up. And the the primate keeper, who was only about five foot four, a very short man, <laughs> uh, said the creature must have been about seven feet tall. And... No. He, as a professional, somebody who'd worked with primates for almost you know four decades, mm -hmm. said that he was convinced that what he was looking at was a simian, you know, not not um not a man at all. And it seemed to have a flat muzzle that reminded him of a bonobo or an older bonobo chimp. Mm -hmm. It's balding on top, had a kind of a pink lip at, uh, lip at the bottom, but was its body was heavy set and hairy like a gorilla, only upright. And it looked at him. Um, he dropped his his light firearm to the to the to the side, oh which my is a gosh. good idea, I think. And uh, yes. it just walked off into the bushes again, looking back to check where he was. He turns to say to his brother, "Oh my gosh, you know what was that we just saw?" Realizes his brother is gone. He'd already left when the creature appeared. And Scarf oh left goodness. him. <laughs> and he gets back to the camp, and his brother's already packing both of their the tents up and you know ready to go home and it changed his life because of course somebody he he said to to me knowing everything that he knew about primates suddenly had that experience you know changed mm -hmm. his whole perspective and in britain especially so there's two i mean there's two very important sightings i think out of out of many but um if if the witnesses are genuine if they're real sightings it would definitely right. point to some sort of unknown creature you know i always say it's not it's not that sighting or the sighting before it's the sum of all the sightings it's that total mm. number that this is not a mass hallucination this is not you know mm. something that all of a sudden everybody's jumping on the bigfoot bandwagon this is something that people are seeing this and this is something that is happening and again, it's the sum total of all of the witness encounters that we're having. And yes, there are false witness encounters. There's they didn't know what it was because they're not into wildlife or, you know, whatever. But for the most part, you know, that's how we decide that this is worth investigating that area is that you have these sightings there. Um, I, I, I totally agree. Amazing. I totally agree. And I just think um, reading, studying for the 
the hairy humanoids uh, chapter of, of Beast of the World, looking at different types of sightings all around the world, they they have so much in common. And I in the book I go back to sightings that were made a long time ago in some cases, and some that are more recent. And what you see is these common, especially in really disparate areas, like the Chitral Mountain Range, where people mm -hmm. don't even have TVs, you know, yes. and and other places like that, the far flung places, and rainforests, and and far out places where people mm -hmm. couldn't possibly know about this this phenomena, this you know this so cultural phenomena, which is yes. Bigfoot. Yes. I'm wondering what well, what's in it for you? That thing's in it for you. Mm -hmm. And their sightings are delivered in such a sort of a piecemeal, matter-of-fact way about what they think the animals are or, or their experiences with them sometimes. Right. I think, well, that's that's a great encouragement for me because then it's not just, oh, maybe this is about conferences and TV shows in the United States. This mm -hmm. is something that seems to stretch out even where there's no attention. Right. Right. You know, and we had discussed earlier about um, how – you and those like you in the UK, how you talking about Bigfoot and bringing information to the masses, um, it, it, you, you're doing the same there as finding Bigfoot and things like that have done here. It's um, making it a little bit less taboo and it's opening the doors for witnesses to come forward with their experiences and not be ridiculed or to have an avenue to come forward with their experiences, so. I mean, <coughs> I hope so. I really hope so because um, I, th I think that's the big problem actually with witnesses for, with, in, in regards to Bigfoot especially. If somebody sees Loch Ness Monster or a Nessie, it's almost like a badge of honor. You know, they go, mm -hmm. whether they, it was a great sighting or not, they go to the papers and it makes the grade and every, all the things thinks that, you know, it, yeah. think that it's a great thing. But every Bigfoot witness I have, almost every time they say, don't mention my name. Don't tell anybody. Mm -hmm. Don't give any details that could identify me. Yes. I'll let you know about my sighting as long as you don't reveal who I am. And I yes. think there's a there's an intrinsic understanding that you don't get any special reward if you think you've seen Bigfoot. No. Um, worse no. still, if you've seen a dogman or something else like that, it yes. you you don't get that promotion in work suddenly. Oh, Lauren, yeah, doesn't yeah. she? She saw Bigfoot, right? Yeah, don't no, forget that. Let's move on to this other girl who's less qualified. Yes, you know. We don't think she's a nutbag. And mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> you know, it's just, the truth. Just be um, cool. yeah. It's it's less taboo than it used to be. However, um, yeah. If you if you admit that you've had a sighting and you're not in a certain setting, yeah, it's you know, and even then there are degrees of sightings. You know, if I walk up to a Bigfoot researcher generally and I say, um, I was running and I don't run. So they would already know I was lying. However, let's just say I was running and I heard someone come up behind me and I turned around and there was a Bigfoot and all that. And they're like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. You know, but if I say I turned around and he wavered and disappeared, like he stepped into a portal, mm. I would not be well received in that aspect. And so, I yeah. mean- we're getting there. We're getting to where we can have, you know, some, in, you know, welcoming vibes from from Absolutely. researchers. But it's and hard. You, you, um, you've happened actually upon that 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 aspect of it as well. There there is actually a big paranormal um, attached paranormal genre to Bigfoot mm -hmm. as well. Yes. Same with UFOs and and this and the rest of that stuff. Which in one way I'm not against it in any way. I don't. Um, I don't believe it's a supernatural creature. At least I don't have any belief about it at all. And I think because I'm interested in undiscovered animals on the whole, I think it's my duty to at least investigate every possible physical aspect of it before going somewhere else. Yes. That's, that's I, my view. I agree. And if it's, somebody's had an experience that's more than that, then that's fine. Yeah. But for me right now, I've got a, it lives in the words. It, We've been witnessed mm -hmm. killing and eating deer. That sounds really physical to me. Yeah. So let's go there first, and then if it's something else, well, then it's something else. Adding adding a, a mystery on top of the mystery. Um, <laughs> I I would I normally I say the same thing. I'm like you know, um, and I think it's more because I want it to be flesh and blood, <laughs> um, obviously. But um, 
it's like, you know, I had made the statement, the very bold statement, they're flesh and blood. I believe they're sentient creatures. And let's solve this mystery before we go on to another mystery. And it's like the universe was like, oh, okay, we're going to send you a slew of very reliable witnesses that have all had paranormal encounters with this mm. creature. Good luck. I mean, yeah. it's just, again, it's, it's not, I can want it to be flesh and blood all I want. But I keep getting these witness encounters from very reliable people that are paranormal encounters. So I don't know what to do with that information, but there it is. I you just kind of have to. <sighs> well, if that's where it leads, that's that's where it leads, and I think that's I, I've this cryptid journey actually has taken me on a, on a really funny journey. So now I don't think I have the right to believe in it because belief denotes faith, and. I've just got to sort of study it as objectively as I can. Obviously, I'm going to be That's subjective in many ways, yes. but um, as objectively as I can. Sometimes with the paranormal aspect of things, I always think, you know, what did um, our ancient forefathers think when they, you know, when they first witnessed beneath the waves an octopus change its color and, and mask, right. it, you know, it match its surroundings? Was that a magical power before that biology was understood? Right. Or is it just accepted as a biological fact? A and could there be, you know, other aspects of these creatures that that match that right. um, unknown physical attribute? So that's that's, that's another get out of jail free card I use constantly. <laughs> yes. in the, it the is that's very realm, yeah. very well put. I I I enjoyed that. That was yeah. that was good. I like that. I may use that in the future and reference yeah, take you if it. that's okay. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> I need some support with this one. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. That's very that's a great way to put it. Okay. Um from Cryptidville. Has Andy looked into uh, the werewolves that are supposedly roaming around the London area? By the way, yeah. that movie traumatized me for uh, life. I don't even like talking about Dogman because of that movie. But go ahead. <laughs> I actually talking about that, I actually can't listen to the song Blue Moon, which opens the movie. Uh -huh. Without feeling slightly unnerved, yes, because of that. I mean, it was such a great movie. Awesome. It was movie. terrifying, but it was good. Mm. But it was terrifying. I was very, Terrif very, very young when it came out, and so yeah, I shouldn't have been that watching it. That. I watched <laughs> films at that age that I would never let my kids watch. Exactly. And our yes. parents are just like, "What you want, American Werewolf in London?" Yeah, I guess you're nine. Sure, you can have it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so that's about how old I was when it came out, and I was exactly. just. I remember having a nightmare <laughs> later that night and waking oh, up yeah. thinking it was coming through the window. Absolutely. Anyway. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, um, look, werewolves in okay. London. So yes. I actually visited the site of uh, an alleged werewolf sighting, which was in Old Camberwell Cemetery in Camberwell in London. Now, the cemetery is from the 19th century. It's not really, really old, but it has lots of old archaic graves there and about 10 acres of forest within the uh, cemetery as well. So in this, it's in this very urbanized area now, anyway, urbanized area in London. But it, uh, it has lots of sort of um, little green corridors into these country-ish parks that surround it as well. And uh, parts of London are like that. You can just suddenly be out in a beautiful wooded area. And it, it's, a, it's a nice city for that. So it's 1995. Um, and just full, full disclosure, I got this sighting from Linda Godfrey originally oh, okay. but i put it in my book because i had a follow-up sighting given to me that she didn't have by witness later oh, okay. which was handy awesome. yes. so <laughs> this gentleman is walking through uh camberwell cemetery he's cutting through to get to a friend's house because it's quicker it's night time it's 1995 suddenly he's pinned to the ground by this huge dog-like creature that holds him down it's slobbering all over him and sniffing him up and down and it's got an alzation like head, but this big strong arms and it's pinning him to the ground. And he's you know, he's convinced that it's a it's a creature. Suddenly, as soon as the attack uh, starts, it finishes, and he observes the creature run off on its hind legs through the through the forest, leaving him in the middle of this graveyard. I went there in the daytime, it's eerie, and there's trees growing out of graves, and there's a forest full of graves because the trees have grown up you know in the 200 years since around it and uh and that's it you know he's traumatized but the weird aspect of the sighting is is he's convinced that he's spared by the creature because he has a disease that dogs can smell weird yeah. super super weird yeah I then 
I talk about this sighting uh, before I published the book and some Irish ladies got in touch with me. They used to live around the park a few years later, 2003, 2004. And one night they were walking home from the pub. They were Irish after all. And <laughs> they hear this growling coming from the park. And at the edge of, of one of the, the big old sort of Victorian walls there, they see this tree being violently shaken like beyond the, the abilities to see if a man or especially any creature there would be no creature here we don't have any bears no there would be no creature to shake that tree and they're both terrified and the growling intensifies and they they dash off in opposite directions away from the graveyard you know in, in fright and that's it this is that's the sighting you know and if you knew oh if you went to the area if you saw the urban aspect of it and that something could be frequenting, I suppose, the graveyard coming through some of the green corridors that lead up to the countryside, you'd be very surprised. Uh, and it's not only there. there, there's sightings in, um, there's a very famous one in 2016 from um, from Barmston Drain, which is in Hull in the north of England. Uh, so we get the, uh, it's a bit of a grim time, so we get the expression, I've been to Hull and back. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I know it's yeah. really cheesy. <laughs> um, yeah, so there was uh, there were several sightings around that time. Actually, one of them uh, centered around the drain. A, a couple were walking at night, and the drain, by the way, a drain there is almost like it's a it's a cut through a drainage channel going through the okay. countryside. Okay. Yeah, so that's why it's called Barmston Drain, and it's they're normally about so 15, 16 feet across and about ten feet deep on, and they mm -hmm. have slanted grass sides and yes. water that runs through the middle. And it, it's not a sewage drain, but it, it basically, that's a very wet area of the country and that allows the water to, to, to flow off the land. And they witnessed this animal, a wolf-like animal, eating an Alsatian dog at the, the side of the drain. And when it saw them, it picked up the dog in its mouth and leapt on two legs over to the other side of the drain, 15, 16 feet, and headed off into the countryside. Another a uh, person saw it leap vertically over a fence and um, and make its way uh, off. And, uh, you know, there were several sightings during that time. There's a small claim to fame. I think Alice Cooper, the singer, became quite interested at that time, was asking around for, for sightings uh, of the of the animal. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it was it was strange. And of course, this is this is Europe. You know, we've got werewolf legends going back for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. But for for such a thing to happen in the modern day seems uh, yes strange. That is Hard terrifying. To mm. That is terrifying. And for it to be that close to civilization, you know, yeah, relatively close. Yeah, that's that's a very terrifying encounter. I have to say. Um, <laughs> Okay, um, this one is from Jordan Warner, um, who is a documentarian and producer. And I know Jordan. Hi, Jordan. My, my sweet Jordy, yes. Um, Jordan's yeah. great. He's not little Jordy anymore. When uh. I first met him, he was, I think, like 13 years old. And he used to be in my chat room and, um, like, loved night colors. And so now he's a young man who's married and starting a family and... Um, has I'm, an amazing I'm always, Jordan, I'm production I'm always watching company. your timeline. Yeah, I'm always sort of yes. looking to see what you're up to. He's he's wonderful. Okay, so Jordan wanted to know, Andy, have you researched any burial burial mounds in Britain or reports of giant skeletons discovered? High strangeness appears in areas with unusual mounds. Yeah, I I haven't, but it, it's on my list basically. Um, but for a very different uh, set of books, which are sort of history books, but looking at weird cross sections of history um, and the mounds, the mounds are there, absolutely. Yes. The reason I haven't um, researched them is simply because of that that zoological sort of th um, viewpoint that I'm coming from. That I'm not right. really looking for areas of high strangeness in essence. I've considered going there for a possible sighting um, or in the hope of one, but not not um to research their effects sorry jordan gotcha um i know you know he asked um giant skeletons also um is there anything like that 
No, I mean. Okay. It, I mean, there, there's uh, there was there's that whole same old nineteenth century, early twentieth century um, rumors of giant skeletons mm -hmm. there, but nothing like you, you have in the USA, really. Okay. Now, of course, there's the uh, Jeffrey of Monmouth um, wrote in his book in the I'm going to say thirteenth century. I could be wrong about the giants that used to inhabit Albion. Britain used to be called Albion. Many, many. Okay. Uh, 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 I would say millennia ago. I'm not sure. <laughs> At least <laughs> two or three millennia ago. And anyway, there was it was supposedly uh, populated by giants. Okay. And Brutus of Troy, after the defeat of Troy, was said to have come to the country and and conquered it, um, defeating the giants that lived here, uh, leaving uh, only one alive as a sort of prize called Gog Magog. And um, he eventually got into some sort of contest with one of Brutus's soldiers and was was thrown off a cliff and, and killed. Um, but there are stories, of course, of the big grey man of Ben McDwee, which although hairy and Bigfoot-like in appearance, seems to be more conforming to a true giant mm -hmm. kind of appearance, 16 to 20 feet tall with you know, huge uh, footprints. And there are some other... Yeah, occasional stories there was one in holcomb in norfolk recently where some very obviously faked prints were attached to um a sighting of an alleged sighting in the sand dunes down there of a 15 foot tall giant and i i'm not i'm not too sure of the story to be honest with you but at least <laughs> yeah. there was some there was some relation in it that people had that background i think right. to call upon when okay. um when faking these gigantic four foot long footprints. <laughs> yes. Well, there's a lot of that going on here too. Um, okay. Rob wanted to know, are British Bigfoot encounters treated as tabloid fodder like in the USA? Uh, sometimes, yes. Sometimes, yes. Uh, let's, there, there's a few tabloids actually that give a, although they're, and I've written for a few of them, although they're, um, headlines of the normal clickbait sort of catchy yes. headlines they yeah. often do treat the subject reasonably well okay um i mean i think being into this genre you can't really expect what would be perhaps something like the times here or the the guardian to pick up one of those stories and treat it with any respect but right for a tabloid, they don't always do such a terrible job um yeah so yes and no occasionally they okay. really are and um other times they're just not interested for some reason it's come along it's come a long way from the national Enquirer. i had bigfoot's baby you know yeah now yeah. it's like <laughs> bigfoot had my baby and yeah the, yeah the you know tables have turned. Yeah. <laughs> okay um tate hieronymus would like to know no relation to bob what's on andy's bucket list for places to research sasquatch whether it be in the uk or usa um, I actually want to go to Peru to um, to research the Iznachi, which is okay. a gigantic monkey-like uh, creature. Um, it's okay. in my book, actually. I'll just try and try and find it for you because it's um, very, very interesting. This creature, and it actually it really ties into a theory I've got about Dogman, which mm -hmm. is, uh, and it's not. It's a theory I've inherited. It's not my own, but the one I, I believe could have something in it, which is that perhaps in Europe and North America, at least, what we see as dogman is that are uh, the sort of functionally extinct remnants of a species of giant monkey that used to inhabit lots of parts of the world. And Iznachi could be one of those. So this is a four foot tall uh, giant monkey. It always looks like a baboon with a body as large as a chimpanzee. Or some people say mm -hmm. a cross between an ape and a sloth, and it's got this big long tail, and it it loves to rip apart the um, the the flesh of the chonta plant, which is really it's like a like a palm. It's really really tough, and this creature supposedly super super strong, um, yeah. and it emits this, you know, this terrible call, and it's really territorial. And the, the locals there are um, terrified of it. So there's a guy over there, um, Doctor Peter Hawking. And he's been uh, he's been researching it, you know, since the eighties. I'd love mm -hmm. to get over there if he's still around and 
and see him and look into that. Uh, there's been some great sightings around the area. It doesn't seem to be very common, rarely seen, but the locals and especially the natives, they've got a strong belief mm -hmm. that it's it's definitely a large four foot tall plus upright monkey. And um, awesome. those things, yeah, they really, really, That's really, awesome. um, yeah, absolutely. Well, I hope you get to go over there very soon. Oh, me too. <laughs> That would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Alan Lasseter would like to know, do you research hellhounds over there? Um, I've got in, yes, in Beast of Britain, there's, uh, so Black Shook is the name or one of the names of the um, hellhounds that we have or the black dogs. Um, there's other names like a, a Naka or a Bar Guest and other things that have been around. Uh, and in the Celtic areas, they have lots of, lots of different names for them. Uh, I, I researched them in my book, Beast of Britain, based upon, again, a natural, naturally occurring phenomena, uh, questioning if some of them could be uh, wolf dog crosses or perhaps um, a remnant of a once, you know, once um, thriving wolf population. I think we had wolves here until the 1700s, if I'm not mistaken, perhaps in, at least in Scotland um although that seems very unlikely that a small population could have survived what you know the, the sightings of the creatures are also very very rare mm -hmm. um so I've, I've looked into that a bit there's a great one at uh coltishall bridge which i think is in norfolk there's a lot of sightings in Norfolk. there seem to be a lot of uh folklore about the creature there and i think there's several sightings on the bridge, but they always troublingly for me end in some sort of um, vanishing <laughs> yeah. in sight of the witness. So, you know, I, I can't be prejudiced. I'm looking into the creature and people say that they vanish. So what am I supposed to do with that other than say, yeah, they definitely do. And that was the most paranormal thing I've dealt with in any of the books. Okay. These black dogs. Okay. Good to know. Um okay and then i'm going to start wrapping it up um because i know that we will have questions for the rest of the night i have two more um one from rob again does britain have a dr meldrum or dr mm. melba type investigator other than the much respected sir david attenborough burrow am i saying that right no <laughs> um for different things there seem to be different people i suppose the most scientifically minded uh, investigators of something like Loch Ness, for example, would be Adrian Shine, who's mm -hmm. the curator of the, the Loch Ness Exhibition Centre and has been there for five decades, scientifically, very scientifically, debunking it almost, you know, which you could say is brave when that's your career. Yes. Your career. <laughs> uh, Dick Rain is another chap up there who was in the original LNIB. Uh, for big cats, we have quite a few people. I, I don't remember them. There's two main guys with big cats. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of them. Okay. My head. Um, and that seems to have a real sort of scientific mm -hmm. um, force behind it because, of course, it's a lot easier. It's a creature we know to exist, and we just yes. have to establish that it exists in this country yes. uh, since the Which, 1970s. They're doing a great job on that, honestly, because I've heard of it here. So. <laughs> hmm. But for the Bigfoot, no, absolutely no. There's no person like that. There was the famous scientist. Oh, I should know his name. If I hadn't asked, you would have known. Brian. Uh, I have to. How can I forget his name? Somebody's going to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Sykes. Brian Sykes. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and he did a really great, you know, sort of bit on, on Bigfoot. He's got a great documentary out. It's fun. He died sadly. Uh, yes. Um, yeah. So he's a British geneticist okay. and, and science writer. Yeah. Okay. And he did. So, I mean, he was very interested in, in Sasquatch and definitely worth checking out his his documentaries. Okay. All right. Um, so last last thing. Um, two part. Your podcast. Um, can you tell us what it's called, how to find it, and kind of what is something that you guys cover on there? So cover the podcast is called Beastly Theories. Went straight from the theme, right? So, um, so Beastly Theories is the podcast, and it's described, self-described as a, 
uh, low tech, low key, low brow podcast. Yes. <laughs> uh, an exercise in nepotism with colleagues in the field uh, to discuss the highs and lows of cryptozoology research. Okay. And uh, crack open the information in their brawny brains and give it to us, the like the layman people who want to find out about it. And, awesome. And, and I will normally interview, I normally interview people that I'm interested in. They've got a certain thing that they're looking into or mm -hmm. a certain passion in the field. Of course, there's lots of Bigfoot stuff that was this, but there's also lots of lake monster stuff and even yes. some pterosaurs and uh, dogmen and including witnesses and other things like that. Um, awesome. Yeah, my mumbly style is present throughout. Sometimes the sound is not great and there's absolutely no editing or presentation whatsoever, but it's on That's, Podbean yeah. and you okay. know iTunes and Apple and Amazon, okay. wherever you get your podcasts, you can find it there. Okay, so everybody go check it out um, because we love a good laid back podcast with good content, right? We don't, it does not have to be you know, fireworks and, you know, intro that just, you know, a good laid back podcast with good content. That's where it's at. You get some of the Absolutely. best info on there. Like this, Absolutely. this podcast is very laid back. Um, okay. And then for the people in your area, because this Night Colors is an international podcast, obviously. So I do actually have a large demographic of my listeners in the UK. So for people in your area, where can they see you next? Um, I'm not speaking anywhere in the UK at the moment, actually, because I'm, I'm, I'm so... You have one job. <laughs> well, I, that's, that's it. <laughs> but I'm so wrapped <laughs> up in this book. I've got to get this book finished. Um, and I've just literally just recently finished a work contract somewhere. So I've got a little time now to try and get it done before Christmas. And I homeschool two kids, you know, so it's kind of. Oh, my goodness. I've, yeah. I've been there, done that. It's. Yeah. It's going well, actually. And my wife takes a lot of it. And she's she's the bright one. So I wish you luck. That's a, a nice. Yeah, it's going well. But time is sometimes <laughs> short. So I'm not yes. speaking anywhere this year. In the okay. UK, but I promise to add loads and loads of dates next okay. year but the best place to find me is to head on to facebook.com okay. forward slash bsov any questions you have even if you just want to chat i don't mind okay. I'll, you know i'll say hi awesome so you guys the links to all of that are in the description so you can go to his facebook instagram all of those places and you can check out um you can follow him so that you can find his newest works you can find his newest speaking engagements when they premiere um and then also his series that will be coming out oh, gosh. Um, yeah. fingers crossed and fingers um, crossed you guys can um, find the links to his books also because they sound incredible. Uh, again, I really think that I think that anyone not even just getting into the topic, but that's been here for a while, uh, check it out because it sounds like you've done your due diligence on all the hairy humanoids. And that sounds, I mean, that's right up my alley because that's my main thing, but you it know, I exciting. think yeah, that's just gonna to be find amazing. Out. <clears throat> just to find out. Yeah, absolutely. And again, if you don't want to read, just listen. There are audio books. Yes. <laughs> it's good for a commute. And uh, if you've got the, the platforms there, they will be free. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on tonight. I've enjoyed having you back and talking about all the things that you've done since you were last on, which is a plethora of things. <laughs> so um, keep doing what you're doing because you are, like I said, you're bringing a lot of value and um, integrity to the topic. And I very much appreciate your work. Oh, thank you. And, and you too. It's always great to catch up with you, Lauren. Lovely to see you. <laughs> Yes, you too. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. All right. All right. Bye. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening tonight to our amazing guest, Mr. Andy McGrath. I do hope that you go check out his links in the bio. If you click on his link tree, again, that will take you to everything or the rest of the links are right under that. So you guys go follow him. Uh, while you're at it, go ahead and give me a thumbs up on whatever platform you're using to listen to the show. Subscribe, ring that notification bell so you don't miss any of my upcoming shows because I am back, ladies and gents. I am back. So you guys go check it out. Um, while you're searching around, liking mine, liking Andy stuff, please feel free to check out my affiliates. These are affiliated shows that um, support night callers and all that I do. Go check out Weird Realities Podcast. They have so much content um, that you can fill up pretty much every night of the week with content that they're putting out. And so between 
I am putting out a show every other week at this time due to time constraints in my personal life. So while you're not listening to me, you can listen to Weird Realities and Bigfoot Crossroads. Bigfoot Crossroads is hosted by Matt Knapp, and he puts out content as well. And it's it's really great witness encounters that he does. So go check them out and also Beaver Hook Productions. All right, you guys know the drill. Stay safe, be kind, and I will see you next time.